Have you ever wanted to build a PC for you or somebody else, but never know what parts to pick? Have you been following guides aimlessly for years, but never know what parts to pick? Don't worry, I got you guys covered. On this video, we're gonna be talking about what parts to pick in what PCs. Let's get into it. Hey guys, Lathan here, and building PCs isn't a one-size-fits-all scenario. Just because you have, let's say, $2,000 for a budget doesn't mean you just Google best $2,000 gaming PC out there. Some people have different needs for their PCs. A $2,000 video editor and a $2,000 gamer have different builds for their needs. So when you're building a PC, it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all scenario because different PCs are meant for different reasons. A gaming PC isn't going to be the same as a server PC, and a video editing PC isn't going to be the same as a family PC. So the first thing you want to ask you or whoever you're building the PC for is, what are you going to be using the PC for mainly? Do you have any side hobbies? Do you want to get into something? Because this all can lead to different parts and different paths you take when building a PC for somebody. This is also important because of the budget. You want to allocate the resources to the best uses of the PC. So if you're a gamer, you're going to want to put as much money as you can into a graphics card because that will provide you the highest frame rates and the highest resolutions for your games to play. If you are a streamer, you might want to put more money into your CPU so that's more powerful so it can encode better. Maybe even a little bit of money going to your GPU as well because some streamers use their GPU to encode. If you're using it as a family PC, you might want to put more storage on it so that multiple users can store multiple documents, multiple photos, multiple files without it, you know, being filled up. In this video, I'm going to be going over every component in your PC and when you should allocate more resources into it to get the most bang out of your buck. So let's start talking about the components. First off, we have the CPU. This is going to be your brain of your PC and it's going to be doing a lot of the processing for all of your daily applications. There are two major manufacturers of CPUs out there, which are AMD and Intel. Intel sells their core series of processors, while AMD sells their Ryzen variants. And I know this sounds very confusing, but the naming scheme is very similar. Starting from the bottom, Intel has their Core i3 processors, and AMD sells their Ryzen 3 processors. Now, these are very entry-level and budget-friendly options for anyone that's building a PC just off the ground, and I can recommend them to just about anyone. If you're trying to save a little bit of your money, you might want to get one of these processors just because of how good they are. The price to performance is pretty good, especially when you're playing some light gaming or doing light office work or anything that's very not intensive. Next, we have the Intel Core i5 and the Ryzen 5 series of processors. Now this is starting to get to a mid-range territory and this is what I'd recommend for anyone that's doing some intermediate gaming and maybe even some light streaming. Some people have dedicated streaming PCs that they don't want to put all of their money into, and I would say this range of CPU would be good for that. Maybe even if you're building a family PC, this can be a really good stop point for those kind of PCs that everyone uses in your house, and it's a basic PC. Now we're about to hit the very peak point of CPUs, and for most people, I would say to stop here because this is pretty much as much as performance you're gonna need. We have the Intel Core i7 and the Ryzen 7. And to be frank, these are beastly CPUs. If you're doing heavy gaming or if you're doing video editing, I think these are the preprocessors for you. They're pretty much high level and there's only one more processor above it, but for gamers and video editors, this is perfect for you guys. Finally, we have the creme de la creme the Intel Core i9 and the Ryzen 9 processors. Now these are top of the line processors that can handle anything you throw at them. They're good at multitasking, video editing, very heavy gaming. This is gonna get you the best performance that money can buy. And for 80 to 70% of people, you don't need that because feeling realistically, unless you're rendering things for your job or doing any video editing professionally, I think that an i7 or a Ryzen 7 might be the best place for you guys. Finally, we're going to be breaking down the names so you guys understand what processor you're going to be buying. 
So when you have a processor, there's a couple of numbers in the SKU that you have to look out for. So you know what generation of the processor you're buying, because obviously an i3 13th gen is gonna beat out an i3 of the 9th gen or older. So you wanna make sure you know what generation of processor you're gonna be buying and also what features it has. So looking at the SKU number, the first, di the first two digits will be telling you what generation it is. Either it's gonna be the newest, like 13th gen or 7th gen for Ryzen, or it's gonna be a little bit older. So it could be 8th gen or 9th gen or 1st or 2nd gen for AMD. So you wanna make sure you know what generation process you're buying, so you know how much performance you're leaving on the table when you're paying for it. Older generations tend to be on sale, so that might be something you're looking into because they try to get rid of the old CPUs a lot and very frequently. So you might wanna look for when they're on sale and when you can buy a compatible motherboard, which is when we're getting into. Then there's gonna be a last letter at the end of the CPU name. This can be a K or an F, and it's very important to know what these means because some of these letters mean that you can overclock them, which is sending a little bit more voltage in it to get higher clock speeds and get you more performance. Having that is very nice to have on the table so you can squeeze every last bit of performance out of your processors. However, some of them will have certain letters that let you know that you don't have discrete graphics, meaning you're gonna need a graphics card to turn on the PC, and without that, you can't use a PC, which in some cases can be okay when you don't have a GPU, but in some cases can be really bad because GPUs can break, and if that breaks, your PC is essentially dead in the water. So take a look out for that. So one thing I forgot to mention was CPU coolers. And that's because a lot of processors come with their own cooler out of the box. This is what's called a stock cooler. And they will get your system off the ground if you need help. However, a lot of them are not built for overclocking. When you overclock, it sends more voltage to the CPU and that creates more heat and the heat needs to be dissipated, so you're gonna to need to get an aftermarket CPU cooler. And the best aftermarket CPU cooler I can recommend is an air cooler. Now these air coolers are very cheap, they work very good and have good performance, so it's very hard not to recommend them to the best of people. However, if you're looking for something a little bit more flashy and cosmetic, an AIO cooler might be the best bet. They're silent, they usually come with RGB fans, and they perform decently compared to aftermarket air coolers. So if you're looking for something a little bit more fancy, you can grab an AIO cooler. Finally, if you're a real enthusiast, you can custom water cool your PC like I did. This ensures you get the best performance because you can have the pump run at whatever speed you want, usually higher than AIO, and also cool your GPU and CPU combined, giving you the ultimate best performance for your whole system. Now this gets very costly, so I wouldn't recommend it to the faint of heart or people that are not comfortable with sending up liquid inside of their PCs. So. All in all, get an aftermarket air cooler or an AO based on your preference. To understand motherboards, you're gonna have to understand the naming scheme because that's very important when it comes to your processor. So starting off with Intel motherboards, they can either start with letters B, H, or Z. Z is gonna be the top of the line motherboards that have the most features like overclocking, more PCIe lanes, and more USB ports, which can be very important for some people like gamers, streamers, and video editors. So if you're one of those, I recommend getting a Z starting motherboard. However, if you're a mid-range gamer or someone that might use their PC a lot, you, the B series are gonna be the middle ground, so they have a decent amount of USB ports, decent amount of SATA ports, decent amount of everything. Finally, we have the H series motherboard which is the budget or entry level type of motherboard this paired with an i3 can be a really good killer on light gaming and light pc usage because you can't overclock the ram and you can't overclock the cpu which is something that a lot of overclock enthusiasts really love to do this offers usually only two slots of ram so you can't expand it doesn't have that many usb ports or pcie lanes meaning you have to buy usb hubs down the line to use more usb devices and the expansion is very limited limited because of how much you started off with. If you're buying a PC for someone that's younger to get into light gaming, or you're using it as you know a NAS or something very basic, this might be the option for you. Now that we talked about Intel motherboards, let's get into AMD. AMD motherboards are gonna start with an X, B, or A. X is gonna be like the Z series on Intel, so they have more PCIe lanes, more USB ports, more SATA ports, and support for overclocking. The B series are gonna be the same middle ground, so they have a decent amount of USB ports, decent amount of SATA ports, decent amount of everything. 
But on AMD motherboards, the B series supports overclocking, which is a big win for anyone that's trying to go for a mid-range mid -range PC pretty much. While the A series is gonna be the budget entry level PC motherboard for AMD. So what to take from this is if you're gonna use the features like overclocking, more USB ports, more SATA ports, more PCIe lanes, then you should put some money into your motherboard. So particularly gamers, maybe video editors, and that's pretty much it. But if you're using it as a family PC, you can go a little bit lower, you can get an entry level or a mid-range board. Especially if you're not doing any overclocking, you should probably get a cheaper style motherboard. One thing to take note of is the first number in your motherboard name is going to tell you what processors you can use. And this is gonna be very important because some processors are not compatible with certain motherboards. Thank God we have PC Part Picker to tell us what motherboards and what CPUs are compatible and what needs a BIOS update, which is basically just an update of the motherboard software. Okay, so the next component is gonna be memory or random access memory if you wanna be specific. And this is pretty simple because all you have to worry about is the capacity, so how much RAM you have, and the mega transfer rate or the frequency. So starting with the capacity of memory, I think everyone should be building PCs nowadays with at least eight gigabytes of memory, just as a get me goer, because four gigabytes is definitely not gonna be enough for a lot of people. So I'm just gonna start with eight, 16, 32, and 64. Anything more than that is pretty up there. Starting off with eight gigabytes of memory, if you're building a budget or entry level PC, this is what I'd recommend for you because this will get the system going and will allow some light multitasking, but nothing too crazy. So if you're just building a PC to start off or giving it to a child or someone younger, eight gigabytes is gonna be good for you. Then we have 16 gigabytes of memory. This has been considered the sweet spot for the longest time and is now a really good place to start from. So 16 gigabytes of memory is what I recommend for most people's uses, gamers, light video editors, and yeah, 16 gigabytes. Then we got 32 gigabytes of memory. This is slowly starting to become the new standard of memory for PC as Chrome starts to eat more RAM, people have more programs running and eating more memory. So 32 gigabytes is what I'm gonna start recommending as more programs use more memory. Finally, we have 64 gigabytes of memory. And unless you are doing some very intense gaming, streaming, or video editing, I wouldn't recommend 64 gigabytes for you. It's gonna be on the higher end side. So if you have the money and the budget, you can add it, allocate 64 gigs of memory for your system. If not, 32 or 16 works fine. Next, we have the frequency. If you're going with, next we have the frequency. If you're going with an AMD motherboard system, then you're gonna wanna have a higher speed because AMD processors love high frequency memory. So anything over 3600 would be preferable. If you are on an Intel based system, you can get away with 3200. If you are on an Intel based motherboard system, 3200 megahertz is gonna be what I recommend for you guys. And this is gonna be a, and this is gonna be a one size fits all for everyone kind of thing. If you're gonna go over 3200 or 3600 megahertz for your system, you might see higher frame rates and faster rendering times, but that's not, you know, the best use for your money, unless you're going for performance. Finally, you have to make sure you know what your motherboard supports, as we are now going into DDR5 memory. So if you have a DDR4 board, you're gonna have to buy a DDR4 memory. And if you have a DDR5 board, you're gonna have to get DDR5 memory. Okay, now we're on storage, and there's a few ways we can take this because SSDs have become so mainstreamed that it's pretty much not that good of an option to buy hard drives. Unless you're looking for high capacity, slow storage, then SSDs are gonna be the way to go. I remember when I built my PC, I made sure I had an SSD to boot my computer and then a hard drive for my files and games. However, the price to performance ratio is looking so much in favor of SSDs that it's hard to recommend HDDs to everybody. For SSDs, I would recommend at least a 500 gig SSD, at least just to start, and you can go from there. If the person wants more storage, they can get a one or two terabyte SSD, maybe even a four terabyte SSD if you have that much stuff to store. But it's gonna vary person to person. And if you want to, you can include multiple hard drives for a large capacity storage, but it's gonna be slower. So I wouldn't recommend that for a gamer or anyone that's looking for fast read or write speeds. 
So maybe for a video editor or a photo editor, they might want to buy a couple hard drives just to chalk all their photos on there because they don't need to access them very quickly. So just to recap, you can get either a 500 or one terabyte SSD, and then you can chalk in a two terabyte hard drive or even a four terabyte hard drive. So those prices are pretty good because of how old they are and they give you a lot of space to work with, especially if you're a video or photo editor. Okay, so now we got to power your PC and what better component to talk about than the power supply. So based on how much money you put into your power supply, this will t determine the longevity of your PC. So if you put a lot of money into your power supply, you'll have more expandability because it provides more power to your system, which allow you to get bigger components and will give you a longer life with your PC. If you only put a little bit of money into your power supply, you're gonna be stuck with your same level of equipment for until you upgrade your PSU. So the first thing I could recommend is putting all of your parts into a power supply calculator and calculating what wattage it recommends for you. Then from that, if you have more budget to allocate, you can buy a higher wattage power supply for your PC so that you can upgrade it down the line. But if you don't plan to upgrade it for like four to five years, maybe even seven, you can just buy a power supply that has enough wattage to power your system. Before you go out and buy the cheapest power supply that meets your wattage requirements, you gotta make sure a couple things. One, you gotta make sure you're buying your PSU from a reputable, manufacturer. If you're buying a cheap, no-name power supply, there is a very high chance that your power supply could be a bomb and burn down your house with your PC in it. So try to stick to name brand PSU manufacturers like Corsair, EVGA, and Seasonic. These companies have very good warranty policies and if anything goes wrong with your power supply, they will ship you a new one in an RMA request. Second is the efficiency rating. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure your power supply is efficient so that it's not pulling so much electricity because pulling electricity costs money. And if you put more money into your PSU, you'll save on your electricity bill with the efficiency ratings. There is bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. And typically I like to stay in the gold range. Platinum if you're feeling a little frisky, but gold will make sure you're getting a decent amount of power draw and not cost you your whole paycheck in electric savings. Let's say you want a game or a video edit on your PC, then you're going to need to buy a graphics card. Some processors also might need a graphics card to operate, so make sure you take a look at that in the CPU section. Anyways, GPUs are what renders frames and encodes and does everything that a gamer and video editor could ever want. So putting money into your GPU can be important for these reasons. If this is gonna be a family or a server PC, then you won't need to worry about that. But if you are, put a decent amount of money into your GPU. So the best way to decide what GPU is for you is to do some research. So depending on what games you play, that will determine what GPU you're gonna need because some games require higher GPUs, which have higher clock speeds and more dedicated VRAM, and they're gonna cost more. So if you're gonna be a gamer, it's gonna be very costly. If you're a video editor, you're gonna have to get a mid-range or higher GPU that can help you encode and get you through your projects a lot quicker. Starting with NVIDIA, we have the 40 series cards, the 30 series cards, the 20 series cards, and the 10 series cards. The 40 is being the most recent, and the 10th is being a very ancient card from almost like 10 years ago or something like that. So ideally, you're gonna wanna get the newest style card. However, the older style cards can be very good value if you're willing to cut out some performance and save some money. One thing you want to make sure of is you're buying the right model card. So NVIDIA has the 4090O. So right now for NVIDIA, we are on the 40 series and there is a 4090, a 4080, and a 4070. There's probably gonna be a 4062, but as of right now, there isn't. This naming scheme falls through all their generations and the higher number, the better the number. 90 being enthusiast level for high levels of performance and the best thing that money can buy, 80 being high range, 70 being mid range, and 60 is gonna be entry level or budget friendly ideas. However, depending on your use case, this budget level card can be really good and can be enough for most people. One thing you wanna make sure of is the generation of card. If you're buying, let's say a 3060, which is last generation and the lowest budget level model, 
This can be sometimes not as good as a mid-range or higher level card from the last generation, so like a 2080. So you're gonna wanna make sure you do your research and know which card for which frame rate you're gonna get for what price exactly. So one thing I like to do is look up YouTube videos that have the same CPU, the same GPU, and the games that I wanna play and look at the frame rates. Are they in the 60s? Are they stable? Do they get higher than 60? Is this what I really want? Because the last thing you wanna do is get a game that struggles to perform on your PC. Then we have AMD's GPUs, which can be a really good option for certain budgets. And they're currently on their seventh generation of GPUs. Right now, they're only selling their 7900 XT, so I'm gonna explain their last line lineup of GPUs and their naming schemes. So they have the 6900, the 6800, the 67, the 66, and the 65. And honestly, you're gonna to have to do your research and know what performance each of these cards get you because some of them might vary game to game and some of these video editing performances will vary a lot based on how much VRAM they have and how much clocking they have, clock speeds they have, sorry. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure you do your research before you follow any words of wisdom that AMD has provided. Finally, we have Intel's GPUs and they are new to the market, so they don't have that much. They have their 700 series of cards and they're mostly aimed at mid-range or budget entry gamers. So if you're one of those, you're going to want to take a look at those cards and their performances respectively to know if they're right for you. Finally, we have your PC case. Now this is going to be a very flexible area because you can spend a lot here or a little here and this won't affect your PC's performance. So feel free to browse and save some money or buy money or spend money as you see fit. More expensive cases will be easier to build in, will have more spaces for hard drives, more space for everything if you want to water cool your system like I have, or if you just need more fan or radiator support, which can be very important to some people, but a lot of people, it's very meh. <laughs> but if you want to have a very well-cooled system that has a lot of space for a lot of fans, you might want to buy a bigger case that you can get more fans into it. But if you want something that's the size of a shoebox so it can fit into a closet, you can also buy that. Just make sure your case is compatible with your motherboard and all of your fans and your CPU cooler and your graphics card because those are big system components and if they can't fit into your case, you're not going to be a happy camper. So do some browsing, do your research and figure out which PC case is right for you. So now we went over how to choose each component for your PC and why to choose them. I'm gonna show you a build that I'm doing for my cousin and their budget was about $1,100 Canadian and this is what I did for that. Okay. okay, so let's go over the parts that I've chosen for this PC build and we're gonna start off with the Asus Prime B660 motherboard. So this is a mid-range motherboard and has everything that you're gonna need. It's pretty recent so it uses so it supports the 12th gen CPU that I've I picked out, you're gonna see that later. It also supports Windows 11, has Asus Aura Sync and all that good stuff you're gonna need. Next up, we have the Intel Core i5 12th gen CPU. This is a 12400, so there's no overclocking on this CPU. However, it's been noted as one of the best mid-range CPUs for a long time, so that's why I picked it up for her. It was also on sale. Then we've got the memory. We've got two sticks of DDR4 memory. This combines up to 16 gigabytes and has a 3600 mega transfer speed, which is a little bit higher than I recommend for Intel, but that's all for the better. Then we've got the team group SSD. This is a one terabyte SSD and that's pretty much it. It's an M.2 SSD, so it's gonna be super fast and it's pretty basic for her. So that's all they're gonna need. Next up, we've got the power supply. I got them a EVGA 500 watt gold power supply. So this is gonna be very efficient and 500 watts is 500 watts is going to be more than enough to support their needs for the PC because they're not going to be upgrading it for any sort of gaming things and even if they do, they can probably step up to a mid-range GPU for them. Finally, we've got the GPU. This is an AMD 6500 XT and this is going to be a very entry-level budget-friendly GPU just to get some light gaming done. 
And yeah, that's all they're going to need. Let's get into the build. First thing I like to do when building the PC is build up whatever I can outside of the case, which is going to be the motherboard, the CPU, the SSD, and the memory. This is the stuff that I can install outside of the case, and then we're going to tackle the stuff that I have to build inside the case. So after unboxing the motherboard, we're going to take it out of its static film that's used to protect it because static shocks might show out this board. And we're going to place it right on top of the motherboard box, just so it doesn't scratch my table or anything underneath, or we don't damage anything underneath the board. So we're going to insert the CPU into the motherboard, making sure the gold triangle is into the bottom left corner, or for simple WANs terms, it's going to be readable from the right way and we're gonna insert this into the motherboard. We don't need to push down or anything because the socket will push it down for us and it will damage the pins if we do it ourselves. All we have to do is then lift up this latch and slide it under this part here. This will make sure that there's adequate pressure applied onto the CPU and not damage anything. Okay, so on this motherboard, we have four slots for the memory. However, we're not gonna just put them in any slots. We're gonna have to follow the motherboard guide or the manual, which tells us which slots to use. I already read it and I know it goes into these slots here, which is gonna be two and four. So let's set them in. All we have to do is line up the notch with the spot on the motherboard and push it in with a little bit of force. All we need to do is wait till we hear that satisfying click and we know that it's inserted correctly. We're gonna follow the same instructions for the next piece of RAM and it will click in perfectly. So now installing SSDs has become easier than ever. Installing an M.2 drive only asks us to remove the cover for the SSD insert one side into the connector and not forgetting to remove the plastic that separates the thermal pad and the SSD. Then we just screw it all back down and we're all good to go. So this is going to be the last part we do before entering the case. All we got to do for these modern stock coolers is place the CPU cooler on top of the CPU and then push the screws down. That's it. No screwing required. Then we have to connect the header to the right header on the motherboard labeled CPU cooler or CPU fan and we're good to go. So when it comes to cases, the more money you spent on your case will really show how much care your manufacturer cares about you because they can make it really easy to build your PC or they can make it a living nightmare. Thankfully, Corsair comes to the rescue by offering a very good and cost-effective solution to case builders. So the first thing we gotta do here is open up the case and head to the back. That's where they hide all of their screws and all of their instructions for their case to make sure they don't get lost in transportation. This is very important because if you need to know certain facts about their case, aka where to put motherboards, SSDs, or whatever, you're going to have to look at the manual. Okay, so now we can get to installing the motherboard into the case. We got to make sure that we install the IO shield for the motherboard, which might be pre-installed on more expensive motherboards. However, this is a mid-range board, so we got to install it ourselves. All we gotta do is press the four corners and pop it in, then we can drop the motherboard right into the case. Finally, we screw down the motherboard to make sure it's not going anywhere and we're all set and ready to go. So based on how much money you spent on your PSU, you might get a semi-modular, a fully modular, or non-modular PSU. And what that basically means is all of the cables are attached, some of the cables are attached, or none of the cables are attached. And ideally, you want none of the cables attached because sometimes you might not need all of them, so you can just tuck them away in the box and it makes it easier for cable management. However, for a lot of people, including myself, I like to get non-modular power supplies just because they're a little bit cheaper and you can use that money towards your build. 
Next up, we have to install the PSU, which is very easy. All you have to do is put the PSU in the designated PSU spot and use the four included screws to screw it in. Not so hard. Then you have to plug in the cable. Now, just about finally, we have the cable management. So depending on how much you spent on your case and how much your manufacturer loves you, this will be easy or very difficult. Thankfully, we went with the Corsair case, making it very easy as they have designated raceways for all of the cables. They included velcro ties, zip ties, and everything you need to make this case very pretty. And even if you're not able to make it pretty, you can just shut the back panel and never see the light of day. Pretty simple and pretty nice back here, Corsair. Okay, now we're on the GPU. And this is gonna be very easy because I already fed the cables through for the GPU when I installed the PSU. First, we gotta peel all the plastic off of the GPU. And then we have to unscrew the bracket that's blocking the GPU and then we can just slide it in. Finally, we secure the GPU with the screws from the brackets and we're good to go. Oh, don't forget to plug in your GPU. That's very important. So all in all, this is what the PC looks like and I think it looks very cool. I think the case looks really nice, the motherboard fits the case and the GPU, well, it's just a GPU. But all in all, you can see that everything complemented each other and it's gonna work perfectly for my cousin. All right, so that's gonna be it for this video. I hope it helped you guys picked out whatever PC parts you need and leave a comment below if you have any questions or have any ideas for my next video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.